I said, can you give me a technical for what I'm thinking? Mm. And he said, no. Well, then I think you're an SOB. <laughs> Up next, part two of the best up close, 1992. <laughs> Happy holidays, everybody, and welcome to part two of the best up close of 1992. Tonight, we're going to look back at the best of sports and those in love with sports, all of whom graced our set in 1992. We're going to start off with the men who coach the games. They whistle while they work. Most likely, outside of my family, the most important thing to me, to be called coach. I always wanted to be called coach. For some reason now, I've gotten to be almost like the coach wouldn't. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, I'm no threat to anyone anymore. And I'm retired now, 15 years. But it's, uh, it's something I always wanted to do. And I always wanted to sit in the front of the bus. Of course, the coach sat in the front of the bus. You, yeah, your own kid calls you coach. Yeah, my, my children. Robbie call. calls you coach. Yeah. It's, it's something that's uh, um, respectful. And it's uh, something that um, there's no price tag on it. And see, most people that I know of have not gone into coaching for dollars. It's just the last 15 years, because of the boob tube, the dollars have come, right. and you get your share of the dollars that way. But they haven't gone into it. Because if, um, and another thing, people don't like to hear this, but coaches are not intelligent people. Because if they were intelligent, they wouldn't go into coaching. I could regale you with stories of McGuire all day. I'll, t I'll tell you my favorite one. I come to my banquet, a, a basketball banquet my second year at Marquette. I sit down. I bring a date, I sit her down next to Mrs. McGuire and I go join Al up at the head table. He nudges me, gives me the arm chuck and he goes, he goes, Ricky goes, never marry a beautiful girl. Well, you know, the chances of that aren't real good anyway. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm more celibate than the team priest we've got <laughs> traveling with us. So, uh, so I'm sitting there and we're, we're talking and, and then about midway through my meal again and you know, I can't get a date at the Wisconsin Women's Penal Institution with a fistful of pardons. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring the guy and I'm eating. So anyway, he says to me, he says, Rick, he says, I'm telling you, he says, never marry a beautiful girl. I said, okay, coach. I said, why not? He said, because Rick, a beautiful girl may leave you. Now he said, an ugly girl may leave you too, but so what? <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so that was my mentor. Why do you, why do you continue to do what you do? I enjoy the relationship with the players and I think I do something rather well. I think there are only three things in this world about life is one, find something you like to do, something you do well, and then find somebody to pay you to do it. <laughs> I love Notre Dame. I think it's been the best thing that's happened to me personally in my personal life. I just hope I can represent the University of Notre Dame as long as I can do it and uh, satisfy the administration at Notre Dame. I will continue to do it as long as my health is fine. And that, that may be tomorrow I won't be able to coach anymore. Mm. But I do believe in Notre Dame. Uh, I'm concerned about it, obviously. You know, I broke into the profession in 1972. And I think at that time, there was a great deal of talk about change uh, and about opportunity. And that's really what, what I'm all about. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I've been very fortunate. I, I don't look at Dennis Green as being an exceptional coach. I think there are some guys who came before me, like Lionel Taylor mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, guys like that. Ray Tony Green. Dungy in, yeah, in, in, in the league. Right, who never really had an opportunity to, to get that job. Tony still is going to get his shot. And I'm convinced Tony will be a head guy. But I think it's really on the athletic directors. It's on the president it's on the general managers to really have opportunity practices and to make sure that the best available guy gets the job. The story goes, you and Keena Turner, formerly of the 49ers, walked in, you opened the key, you opened the door, and you and Keena Turner walked into the Stanford office and you both burst out laughing. Neither, we didn't even look at each other. Both looked and both laughed independently. <laughs> <laughs> the sweetheart. Well, the real reason was it wasn't the trappings and you were offered as many as six cars to use and you said, I don't need six cars, I have one car. It wasn't the trappings. It was the job. You wanted to apply your skills as a teacher to kids, the raw materials, quote unquote, of life, who were willing to learn, right? Well, no question about it. I think at some point that becomes more important to you. And as years pass, more and more important to be able to teach, relate what you know, to pass it on, so to speak. Mm -hmm. A good part of it is teaching the athletes themselves on the field, developing their skills. You can take great pride in that. The kinds of things I, I did when I was working for Paul Brown, developing skills. The, the way that I look at this, you know, there was charges of nepotism when, when Dave was with me. And this was after we had been in Super Bowls. 
Uh, when, when we're in Super Bowls and Dave was carrying his load to help us get into the Super Bowls, you never heard anything about nepotism. And then when we struggled for a couple of years and things weren't going exactly the way that they were earlier, uh, Dave became a target. I think people were afraid to take me on at that time, so that's when the initial charges of nepotism uh, started to uh, come about. As far as uh, Cincinnati is concerned, I just think that, that Mike Brown uh, knew that he had a fine young coach in Dave, and Dave had no idea that Sam Weich wasn't going to be there. And I'm sure that Mike Brown didn't have an idea that Sam wasn't going to be there the day that Sam walked into his office. They had a year to evaluate Dave as an assistant coach, and they certainly knew of the background because our families were close. But they also watched him work for a year, and I don't think Mike Brown would have made the decision that he made if he didn't think that Dave could do the job. There's no way that anybody can ever really experience the feeling that you have when you win. Uh, not winning because it came easy, uh, winning uh, under some adverse situations, you know, taking a, a team that's last and winning with that team and accomplishing something. There's no way in the world anybody can ever experience that feeling unless they've act act actually done it. And mm -hmm. uh, that's what drives me. I, uh, yeah, I want to win. And uh, the other thing that drives me is I don't want to lose. Do you feel that in any of this stuff, in any of the reaction, that both sides have some wrong on both sides? No question. I mean, uh, I've been learning on the job. And, uh, and as I say, I don't think that they really uh, know me well enough to, to write some of the things that they write. Uh, some of it is sensationalism. Uh, it's a market in which they're competing, uh, tabloids. And uh, some of them are in danger of going out of business. And uh, they mm. strive for uh, the back page headline. I mean, when Bobby Bonilla hits a two-out home run in the bottom of the ninth, and the next day I'm on the back page for some minor negative thing, uh, it looks to me like they're really writing in a negative mode mm -hmm. rather than a positive mode. All day long, I'm happy. When I get to the ballpark, I'm happy. Right. Now, when the game begins, I'm happy. For six or seven innings that we're out in front, I'm happy. Right. And then the last couple innings, when we lose, I'm sad. Right. And then I'm sad the rest of the night. Right. And then when I wake up again, You're happy. I'm happy again. Some of these coaches are part legend, part lunatic. I guess that's what it takes to be the best. In a moment, the funny folks, the silliest, the funniest moments of the year. More Up Close after this. Up Close is brought to you by Budweiser, the king of beers, who reminds you, friends know when to say when. Welcome back to the best of Up Close 1992. What's so funny about sports? Well, apparently just about everything. Witness a few of our uh, <coughs> offbeat moments in 1992. Mark Rippon now, ladies and gentlemen, will perform in alphabetical order the entire 50 states by memory, and he'll do it in less than 20 seconds. Are we ready to go? Ready. I'm going to time you. Ready? Go. Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Idaho, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Mexico, New York, North Carolina, North Dakota, Iowa, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Vermont, Virginia, Washington, West Virginia, Wisconsin, Wyoming. 17 seconds. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's a new record, too. And this all, you give it all to your grade school, right? Westview Grade School in Spokane, Washington. If you're watching, you can be very proud. You know, it's, it's certainly going to be tough to win the third. Wait, wait a minute. It's yeah. Super thing. Dave. Super. He knew Super Dave. Yeah, but Mario's in my parking place. I'll <laughs> <laughs> right there. Okay. Great, 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 great seeing you again. Yeah, okay, hurry up. <laughs> See, everyone's here at the cable. You, you never know That's who's going to turn up there. Good. You're a fan, by the way. Yeah, Super Dave. Fan. <laughs> Super Dave. <laughs> a little plug for the other guys, too. Did you ever hit your finger? Mm hmm Why is it that piddle poo won't do? Mm-hmm. Why is that? Why, when you hit your finger, you got to say... To really cure that finger, you have to say something ugly. That's true. There's no and, doubt about uh, that. I never did cuss much till I got excited. So you're saying coaching is more or less like the, the hammer hitting the finger of life. Oh, yeah. You, uh, everybody says, why is he acting like that? Well, put yourself in a place. You see your life going down the drain, and a referee, you know, is uh, out there blowing a the whistle on you, and, uh, and a little rascal, you know, like the call against... Uh, <laughs> Uh, against Notre Dame. Uh -huh. The guy piles him in there and he looks around and sees a guy throw his coat down. He said, well, you shouldn't do that. I'll just call a foul on you and cost Notre Dame the game. And you're supposed to say, nice call. <laughs> nice so call. Did you say something once to a referee about thinking something? Yeah, I went up to him and you, you got to be careful. I, I said, can you give me a technical for what I'm thinking? Mm. 
And he said, no. Well, then I think you're an SOB. <laughs> I've heard about Italian basketball. I had to see it from, you know, so Sean came with her assistant. Uh -huh. I don't have an assistant. I don't want an assistant. Uh -huh. I have enough trouble, you know, just taking care of myself. <laughs> right. See, that's where I'm at. I would take care of my assistant. It's called low self-esteem, by the way. Right. Anyway, so she comes so in. We go to the game. We go to the game. It's like, it looks like it's, it must hold about 14,000. It was the playoffs. Mm -hmm. He wasn't on a very good team. Right. But it's amazing to me. There's like 10 guys on the team. Now, Cooper is like the big, the big gun. Uh -huh. I, he was, he's a great athlete. You know, it's, it's fair to say that he was maybe over his prime. But nevertheless, he still was phenomenal. Right. A, a great athlete. Right. But the rest of the team, I don't know. I mean, they, they're learning how to play. Right. I was watching the bench. There's like 10 guys, like, you know, at 12. Half of them look like extras from like... Uh, you know, like uh, Seven Beauties or uh, Two <laughs> Women with Sophia Loren. They're, they have beards, they're making pasta on the end of the bench. So it's all coop, coop, coop. Right. So, but, you know, so he'd pass it off to a guy. He said, I'm sorry, I was cooking. <laughs> you know, I said, you're supposed to cut to the basket. He didn't say that. I don't do any impressions. But it was amazing. So it was so loud. Yeah. It was, first of all, it was, it was squingeely. Now, I'm not even sure what that is. Is that a dirty word? Squingeely. Is that like a, a pot? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. But they were, we'll find out. I'm it was sure. a free thing. Right. Everyone was eating something in a dish. <laughs> and it was like, when, you, when they yell at the refs in Italy, they go bananas. I mean, yeah. all these fa all families go. Do they throw things? Throw things. They throw their children. They don't, <laughs> they're so into the, before the game started, they're screaming. You know, when you go, even when you walk into the stadium, uh, here's my ticket. Come on! They're screaming at the ticket guy. <laughs> It's un I got my my blood pressure went so went sky high. In fact, right. I had to go to a, uh, an emergency room. They were yelling at the ticket table. Yeah, so. come on, let me get in there. <laughs> and that's a, that's it sounded like Rickles. That wasn't an Italian patron or whatever. A patron means you run a museum. I don't know. You get five hundred dollars. You but, think you think Tommy's going to stay Dodger manager? There's talk that he might be going to. St. Pete, as yeah. the Piazzas. Yeah, I, I really think, I think he'll stay with the Dodgers. Right. I, think he, I think he believes that there is a chance for them to finish above Houston. Right. <laughs> uh, Houston's having a great year. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> everybody's having a great year, except the Dodgers. You know, Henry Rodriguez the other night, did you see him? He was out in the outfield going, that's over my head. <laughs> he didn't even run for it. He just went, it's over my head. <laughs> it was great. And Lenny Harris is at second base going, <laughs> <laughs> the game's on, you know. So this is a, this is a struggling team, I guess, is what you was struggling. That's yeah. a wild guess. <laughs> a wild guess. Struggling. Kevin Gross is on the mound, you know, and he got a he got a no hitter, and ever since then you can't talk to him. He just sits alone in a dugout, smelling his glove. <laughs> <laughs> and Tom Candiotti throws that, you know, that a knuckler. That, yeah, that funny pitch, and his arm is like this uh, at home, you know. They, they put him in a VA hospital, and go make your wrist work, you know. <laughs> But they they got they got a great future. Kip Gross, they bring in. Then you know the game's over. Right, Kip Gross. Yeah, ninth inning. Great stretch move, mm -hmm. and then he pitches, and you know, the scoreboard, you know, the walls in Dodger Stadium are going, don't, it hurts! <laughs> don't hit me anymore! <laughs> don't hit me anymore, I can't take it! The ball keeps hitting the wall, yeah. and Tommy leans on the dugout, and Joe Ferguson, who stands right behind him, goes, what do you think, Tommy? I think I hit the wall. <laughs> but what strikes me funny is when Harry starts grousing, when they're losing, uh -huh. and he gets into these, I just can't figure it out, Jags. <laughs> Here's a guy, <laughs> Danny Jackson. <laughs> Hasn't won a game in his last 17 starts, and he's making $2.2 million a year. I just can't figure it out. How does he look the owner in the eye when he collects his check? He must wear a ski mask. The rest of the teams must chip in to pay his salary, because they're all getting fat off this guy. I just can't, can't figure it out. out. That could, that's sort of his unwritten, written line. Oh, that kills the payoff line to anything, right? Oh, and he gets on these. I remember one time Dave Concepcion and missed the fly ball in the infield in the sun. Mm -hmm. And he goes, Steve, here's the guy, Dave Concepcion who hails from the Dominican Republic or Puerto Rico, one of those islands where the sun shines 365 days a year, and he misses a pop-up in the sun. I just can't I figure, figure it out. <laughs> I'd like to see about eight or ten of your favorite, say eight, of your favorite singing stars all performing the national anthem at once. Let's start it off with this way. I'll start as Johnny Mathis, you go as Frank Sinatra. Here Sounds we go. Good. Marty, a national anthem. Start with Johnny Mathis. Frank Sinatra. 
was marvelous. Was so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce a dear personal friend of mine, Mr. Gordon uh, Bigfoot. Gordon Lightfoot. Yeah, whatever. Who's say can you see by the dawn's light what so proudly we hail? Mr. Willie Nelson, ladies and gentlemen, Willie Nelson. For the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming. Mr. Neil Diamond. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in there, gave through through the night. Mr. Stevie Wonder. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> oh, gave proof through the night hey! that our flag was still there. I think that's wonderful. This is Carol Channing. Oh, say, does that star spangled banner yet wave? Ray Charles, ladies and gentlemen. O'er the land of the free Oh, you got the right one, baby, yeah, yeah, huh? And, and, and now here's Doolin' Lewis, you see. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see you, Pops. <laughs> and the whole bubble-bubble-bubble jazz of the bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-bubble-
taken whatever uh, punishment they have or have had to take because of that, uh, they welcome them back into the fold. Uh, I think, for example, as far as Pete Rose is concerned, he's paid a price, he's done his community service, uh, he's a superstar, he should be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, I haven't followed those other cases that much. Mm -hmm. uh, well, take, for example, uh, Magic Johnson. Uh, it's a very unfortunate situation, uh, the fact that he's contracted AIDS. Uh, I don't think that he's trying to justify conduct that most Americans would disapprove of. Uh, on the other hand, I think it was altogether right for him to be on the Olympic team. He is a great player. And not to have him on the team, you would not have a representative team. Mm -hmm. That's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. What can you say about people, and people talk, we talk about adversity this week, you know, this football player wants to overcome this or that or an injury, is, but real adversity and the power of love to get you through that adversity. I'll tell you that that was the most important thing for me because uh, it's tough enough going through a situation, but when you have people that are, that are rooting for you, that believe in you and love you, it gives you a lot of determination and strength. And, and I really held on to that. And I think that it's important to know that everyone goes through tough times, whether emotionally, whatever it be in your life. The, the important thing is to get past it and learn from it as an experience and, and go beyond. I always say go forward. You've got to move forward. That's the whole reason, I believe, for being here and learning. Travel arranged through Continental with service to every major ski resort in Colorado and throughout the Rockies. Continental, one airline can make a difference. I ask this question probably never, but because of the person that you are and the range and the travels, I think I want to ask it to you this way. What have you come to know about mankind in your travels? What have you come to know about the races and the love and the lack of love between them? I think about that a lot, uh, because I, I think except for possibly track stars, but certainly tennis stars, we have traveled to more different places in a very short period of time than any other athletes. Not even soccer players get this to this many players, or even golfers. Um, people do have some commonalities, family. Uh, beliefs, in spite of the fact they may have been in a country uh, that, that was communistic and, and repressed religion. Um, but every place I went was provincial. Mm. Every place I went was provincial. That mm. is, there was somebody there, some group in that place, which, if transposed to America, would be the blacks of this group, mm -hmm. so the Hispanics mm -hmm. of that country. What does that say about the human condition? Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's just that Everybody is looking for somebody to look down upon. Mm. Uh, and that saddens me, but it also gives me a, a, a first-hand um, measuring stick. When I come back to America and I feel that, well, if somebody didn't do me right or somebody dissed me, mm. and I think it was for uh, racial reasons, well, I, well, I've seen it happen to somebody in Japan too, or Australia, or England, or mm. France, or Germany, or Spain. I've seen it with my own eyes, so I look at it a little differently here up close is brought to you by budweiser the king of beers who reminds you friends know when to say when have a safe and happy holiday from all of us up close coming up monday eric lindros of the flyers we'll see you then